Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for today's event. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm a bookseller here at Pals Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check our lineup of upcoming virtual and in-person events by visiting pals.com. We've got many authors, Marlon James, Alton Brown, AJ Jacobs, Jennifer Egan coming up in the next few weeks. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, I believe. Uh, or you can sign up for our weekly events email at pals.com. This afternoon, we are delighted to welcome Chloe Caldwell. Chloe is the author of I'll Tell You In Person, Women and Legs Get Led Astray. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, Bon Appetit, Vice and The Cut, among others. And her essay, Hungry Ghost, was listed as a notable in the Best American Non-Required Reading 2017. She is here this afternoon slash evening, depending where you are, with her latest book, The Red Zone, A Love Story, which Kirkus Reviews has praised and said, Caldwell's candor about all things menstrual is the greatest strength of this dynamic book, provocatively intimate reading. Zaina Arafat, author of You Exist Too Much, says, the necessity and urgency of the red zone made me wonder how I and any woman had lived so long without it. Through the lens of PMDD and the female body, Coldwell refracts every issue imaginable from relationships to hormones, to queerness, to stepmotherhood and blended families, all with hilarity, intimacy and depth. Feeling seen by this book is an understatement. It's a survival guide. Mm -hmm. Joining Chloe in conversation, we are delighted to welcome Claire Diderer, her writing has appeared in Vogue, The New York Times, Slate, and Salon, amongst others. And she's the author of Love and Trouble and the New York Times bestseller, Poser, My Life in 23 Yoga Poses, which the great memoirist Danny Shapiro called a powerful, honest, ruefully funny memoir about one woman's open-heartedness, open heart, sorry, open-hearted reckoning with her demons. Uh, this event will include a Q&A. You might see at the bottom of your screen uh, a button that says Q&A. Um, write your question in there. Try and make it a question. Try and make it brief if you can. Um, if you see someone that has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, um, feel free to give it a thumbs up, upvote it, uh, to put it to the top of the list. Um, that's it from me. Please put your hands together in your little, little bubbles wherever you are. Mm. And welcome Chloe Caldwell and Claire Diderot. Thank you. Hi. Hi there. Hi, Chloe. Hi, Claire. Um, I'll just jump in and say congratulations. I'm so I love this book and I'm a Chloe Cald Caldwell fan from the get. We were just talking about how we first met online um, or via email when Chloe sent me a note before her first book even came out. And apparently I wrote back saying she sent me an essay and I said, well, I'm a misanthrope and I hate everything, but I loved this or something like that. Yes, that's pretty uh, much it. Those are all uh, true facts. Um, anyway, so congratulations. I love your work. Thanks, Claire. I really appreciate you doing this with me. It's a thrill. Um, so my first question, and I think it's a kind of obvious first question, but can you talk about how you decided to write this book? How did it come into being? Yeah, sure. Um, so in 2017, I had just turned 31 and I started to experience really severe PMS um, mm -hmm. during the same time that I started dating someone. So that wasn't the best combination. And I, I tried to ignore it for a while, but it just, it kept happening it kept creeping in, kept creeping in. And um, then having someone that I was dating kind of showed me this sort of mirror. So we started hmm. to see the cycle together. Hmm. Um, and even then I still wanted to, to deny it. Um, and I thought I could control it, but then I started to get really interested in it and um, why this was happening and, and why it had never, why it had never happened before. And someone, um, it was my therapist mentioned premenstrual dysphoric disorder to me. And I was sort of shocked that I had never heard of it before. And none of my friends had heard of it either. So I went down a rabbit hole of learning about it and kind of researching it and looking for books on it and just getting really curious about it. And 
that same time, 2017, by then maybe fall 2017, I wrote one essay called The Red Zone, A Love Story, and I wrote it for Long Reads. Um, and my editor was Sari Botten, who worked at Long Reads at the time, and she helped me. It was a very like long form essay and very detailed. And um, from there, that's really where the conception began, um, because I felt like I had I had finished that essay, but there were still more I more I wanted to say and more I wanted to explore. And I started thinking about periods as a plot and how would I apply this as a literary device mm -hmm. and I hadn't seen it done before and I was sort of excited by that idea because it seemed so weird and and unique and I had a couple friends that I talked I spoke to and someone said you know you should really keep writing you should write about the red zone it's like you're because I we mm -hmm. referred to it as the red zone because of an app that we were using to track my period and my cycles um my friend said to me like the red zone is such a funny kind of such a great term and I want to hear more about it so I was mm -hmm. sort of emboldened to keep taking notes on it keep paying attention to it keep reading about it and the more I read about it the more kind of controversial I saw PMDD was and whenever something sort of controversial or mysterious it always makes for something interesting to write about. Yeah I was going to actually ask about that just hearing you talk about how you started noticing that they were getting more intense and you you had a, a diagnosis, which we'll talk more about later. But do you think there's a way in which the fact that you were a more experienced memoirist at that point or a more experienced writer made you go toward the discomfort of the subject rather than away? Mm. Like That's interesting. Well, yeah, definitely. I think my friend had also said to me, she said, like, how great would it be if people ask you at a dinner party, like, what, what's your next book or what are you working on? And what's it about? And you say, like, my period. And that's all you say. And I was like, yeah, that's hilarious. And people already think that I, you know, write so much about about my life um, that I thought, well, if I'm already known as the person who writes so much about their life, then I might as well. I didn't really have any I didn't really have any qualms about also writing about my period. So yeah, I think I did lean into the discomfort because it was such a fascinating subject matter to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that speaks to my next question, which is, were there obstacles in either writing or publishing the book that were connected? You know, there's so much shame and embarrassment around people's periods, and that's what a lot of the book is about. Did that shame and embarrassment inform either your process or your publishing process? Actually, yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, I had, you know, I had written this book, Women, um, a novella that came out in 2014, and a lot of different agents like approached me at, because this the book had done, you know, pretty well in certain circles. And I had an agent who wanted to work with me based on her her read of Women, and mm -hmm. I, I signed with her right when I published The Red Zone essay and she, she liked the idea or said she liked the idea and was really excited about it but as as months went on and then months turned into years I really didn't hear anything from her and there was oh, you mentioned that in the book yeah. you keep not hearing back from your agent about the period book yeah which doesn't feel the best um <laughs> and I also had some other agents reach out to me who were like oh you know I love I love your work and I love women would you like to meet for coffee I'd love to know what you're working on and I would say yeah I actually have this I have this book and I have a draft of it and I have you know so much to say about it I'm really excited about it here's what it is and then the agent wrote me back and she was like, never mind. <laughs> you know, really? I don't know if it was the topic or or what it was, but people, it was really hard for me included to I could conceptualize the book, but I it was hard to structure. Um yeah. I wasn't sure how to structure a book like this. And I wasn't sure how much should be incorporated with research or not. Like if, if I should tip to that end, if I should tip to memoir, if it should be a blend, if it should be an essay collection, if it should be linear. Mm -hmm. So that, that I think was, was part of the struggle. Um, so yeah, that was, that was challenging. So I decided to stop working with that agent because um, when an agent doesn't, you know, respond to you, you start your self-esteem of, of your book and your writing starts yeah. to totally plummet. So, I'm aware. when agents are supposed to be lifting you so mm -hmm. so yeah we we cut the cord and then from there I submitted on my own to um 
soft skull to uh, my editor. Oh, really? Yeah, to Yuka Igarashi, because mm -hmm. I was a fan of some other books that she had yeah. edited. So I had sort of done my research and I knew her style and I thought mm -hmm. that she might share the vision with me and she did. That's amazing. I had no idea of that story and the successful outcome of pitching your own book. That's I pitched amazing. it um, in the vein. I had a I had a vision for it where I told her that there you, there's the memoir called Flash Count Diary by mm -hmm. Darcy Steink, yeah. and then there's the book called Motherhood by Sheila Hetty. Yeah, and then my book. So I told her like that that was the the lineage of my book, and that there was like the grandmother, the mother, and the daughter, and that's how my book would fit. And um, she really that. liked that. <laughs> she liked that, and yeah. and then she sort of pushed me in the memoir angle. Not that I wasn't calling it a memoir. I wasn't really calling it anything except the red zone, a love story. <laughs> but um, she said, you know, I think if we share the vision of this being a linear memoir, I think we can, we can work together. And she also emboldened me to bring in more aspects of my life because I was really stuck on it for a while. I, I was really like, I really want it to be the, per this period book. And like, the year in the life of a period and it was going to be diary form and she really wanted me to shake off that identity and expand um so that's where some of the other the other aspects like blended families um comes in so before it was going to kind of have this tight form of being a single year and then yes it and, and then the years on. then the years kept going <laughs> without it being you know how it is like you write a book in a year, you think it's done. It's absolutely not done. And, and so that's kind of where I was at. I was, all right, all right, I have this draft. So from there, I started playing around with so many structures. I think at, at one point it was structured like pre-menstrual dysphoric disorder. Like I tried that mm -hmm. structure. I tried different years jumping around. I tried so much stuff and I was getting really experimental with it. And mm -hmm. I was a little bit lost maybe. <laughs> and then you could kind of brought me back and, and said, you know, this could just be a really tight frame of like, these three years so it starts with like meeting um my husband and then getting married and through the lens though of PMDD and, and different relationships and things with identity in that way it reminded me of do you know the book the seven good years by Edgar Carrot I don't really know. I've heard of it yeah I've never it's read so it good. and I think you, it has a it's fragmented and funny and a lot of the things I think of your writing as being but it follows the year it's the years between when his son is born and before his father dies but that yeah. but I mean I think that you your final structure I have so many questions about it but I feel like what you're describing as you tell me about the process of structuring the book really sounds to me like you're coming up what against what is a really classic problem in memoir writing, which is this, when you're writing about something that has a really overt subject matter, um, because what you're doing is balancing theme and chronology. So are you, how do you move the themes through the story or do you kind of clump it into essays on themes? And was what was that like in your writing? Did you feel a tension between kind of themed chapters and chapters that moved the plot forward? Yeah, and also, to, to what you're saying, that's why I eventually was just kind of compromised of like, oh, okay, it's a linear memoir. It doesn't have to be super experimental. It's hard enough to get a book published and then especially a book on your period. So I felt like that was my compromise with the publishing industry of like, okay, well, you get to write about your period, but it's got to be linear. You know what I mean? Yeah, I couldn't really see that. I, I mean, I loved that part of it. I loved that it sort of moved forward as a story. And I felt like one of your points of the book, which is this sort of dawning realization that the story of your peri period is the story of your life because you're having it all the time. I felt like the greater breadth of time that you covered kind of underscored your point in a way that was really exciting to me. Yeah, and it, it was a really specific time in my life and it's not happening anymore. Like it, that was just such a strange time and I recognized it as a strange time because I, I literally felt dominated by my period in a way that I had never experienced before and I, that I don't experience now. Um, yeah. So I really wanted to capture that because maybe, you know, part of me knew that it, it was fleeting. Um, but yeah, to, to your question about, about the themes and, and the structure, we went back and forth on that a lot, like which, which parts needed to be full chapters, which parts could be, we did, I think a, a bit of combining chapters. Um, 
and then extracting chapters and moving things around and moving things around. And, and eventually I, I started to really like the linear um, timeline because it, it was helpful. But I, I, you know, I know a lot of people are anti, like don't want the arc of, you know, going from going from the darkness to the light. But I felt like with this book, that is what it was about was acceptance in a lot of ways. So I, I just, I just submitted myself to that. And I think hopefully it's, it's a better book for that because it's there, there's a, a little, there's a bit of an arc it's subtle, but it's, but it's there. Well, we'll come back to this darkness to the light uh, question a little bit more after we talk a bit more about the book subject matter. Um, I wanted to talk a lot about the, the volatility of the main character and of the other women around her and of myself um, and the way that this book, what I felt like what it really did was played with um, the idea of the stable self, right? Like it's really undermining this idea that there's a unified self. And I kept thinking, I don't know, I wanna read you a quote from Lydia Millet. Do you know her work? Yes. She has this incredible book, Magnificent, and she has this quote in it that says, the fairer sex was more changeable than the unfair sex. In practice, this meant the women's madness sometimes receded, but with men, it was constant. When it came to insanity, women were indecisive while men never let up. Oddly, the chronic insanity of men was often referred to as stability. The men being permanent sociopaths got credit for consistency, whereas women being part-time neurotics were typecast as flighty. Essentially, the female bouts of sanity were used as weapons against them. So does that speak to you at all or? <laughs> yes, yeah, it's interesting. It's, I love that. Um, you'll have to send that to me after. I will. Put it in the chat or something. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know how I've been thinking about it is, just as like a literary form of just being cyclical versus, you know, there's, there's that book, um, meander spiral and explode about different literary forms. Um, and just thinking about the cyclical nature that people who menstruate live in and people who don't menstruate don't have the same experience. That's part of my fascination with it. And I think one of the things I came across when I was researching was how, you know, our, our hormones are different every single day. So we're never in the same reality two days in a row. And I just, it just kind of blows my mind. And then, or, and then if we live with someone who is in the same reality every single day, it's just such, it's such a wild thing. So I really, I wanted to get like that cyclical nature down. Um, and I had heard Sheila Hetty on a podcast who wrote motherhood talk about like, why isn't that a literary form, a literary structure for people living in that reality. Um, the way the structure so commonly is just going from like the beginning and the climax and then the end, right. right? And then for us, it can go more like this. So that's something that I wonder if that will eventually ever turn into a genre of its own. Yeah, I mean, it's Sarah, um, Sarah Rule, the playwright, she wrote this yeah. book called, she talks about it in her book, 100 Essays I Don't Have Time to Write. She talks about the shape of the climax, the orgasmic climax, yeah. um, and how do we get away from that? You know, my, la my book, Love and Trouble, was built on a spiral and that idea, and so I was really excited about me under spiral explode, and my students are too. Like the idea that we can get out of this forward motion kind of idea, I think is very exciting to women writers. Exactly. And it's, you know, it's sort of hypocritical because I like my book, although there it, it is cyclical and I think in ways it is repetitive because I wanted to get through that repetitive nature and, and pattern, but at the same time, it does have, you know, the normal arc too. So again, compromise with, with the publishing industry. Yeah. I'm super interested in repetition in memoir because that's so much of our lived experience is repetition or making the same mistake over and over. And, um, it's very hard to write in a way that's, you know, not boring, but yeah, it becomes also, redundant for the reader. Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes redundancy is, uh, is the right thing. Um, can you just tell us a little bit, just in a very broad way, I guess, just the story of your period, like the sort of over how you conceived it from when you first got it to where you mm -hmm. are now. With it. Oh yeah. Interesting question. Um, <laughs> so interesting. I got my period when I was 11. I was very young. Um, yeah. 
11 or 12. I think I, I play a little bit with memory in the book too, because it's, it's so interesting. And this is what I learned with the interviews of all of the other people with their, their periods. Um, a lot of people have no, have, don't have a memory of it. And you would think that something, something like that would, you know, you would know the day or, or you would know the age, but for me, yeah, I was, ele- I was 11 or 12. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I was in sixth grade. And I think at the time I met my period in, with just total denial and total shame. And I talk about this in the book. It was sort of a confusing time. You know, this was the nineties and it was like people really, you know, there's like the Judy Bloom books where people really wanted their period. So it's like, you either really want your period and want to like be this woman and like have breast and stuff. Um, or there's the other extreme where you just, you, you don't want it all. There wasn't a lot of room for in between. And I don't think we were talking about periods with nuance. Um, mm. a, a lot of, a lot of people were just told like, oh, you're going to be, you're going to be miserable. And, you know, it's the curse and, and stuff like this. Um, so I just, I totally ignored it. And I, I like bled all over the couch in, in my memory and, and didn't, didn't really know how to handle it. And it's, you know, you I think about it now and you think about these, these kids who are 11 and suddenly having to have to deal with bleeding and it, it, it really blows my mind. And yeah. then having to have to deal with that at school um, without support from, from teachers and w- without products and stuff like that. So yeah, I met it with a lot of denial and shame. And then from there on out, um, I, you know, I had pretty painful periods from, from what I remember and was always taking a lot of ibuprofen, but never did I care for it or like honor it or support it or have any curiosity about it or interest in it. Um, and yeah, same thing through, through my twenties and just kind of, um, the culture sort of like white knuckle through it. Like, mm-hmm you know, oh, you have cramps, you're fainting. Okay. Well, you have to go to work. It's, it's just this, this, you know, just white knuckle it. Don't, don't tell anyone or, you know, you'll seem weak. And I just don't believe in any of that anymore. Um, so yeah, it was like that. It was like that through my late twenties. And I think in my late twenties, I began, you know, that's when the period apps came out and mm-hmm. some, sometime around that, I don't know what year, but, um, those were interesting. And I had some friends using those. And even then I kind of was like, why would you track your period? You know, even at first, I think I I wasn't, I wasn't even interested in that. And then slowly, like I said, my period (laughs) began to dominate me like this Mm -hmm. crazy monster. And like, that got me, that got me tracking and got me thinking, got me really curious about what was going on and, and why we didn't talk about it. And, and now I just, I, I bring in so much support for my period. And I, I think about, I look at the calendar in a different way. And I think about my social engagements and, and physical symptoms and mental symptoms and um, rest, you know, and I don't think any of that is weak. I think that that's, that's all strength. And so I'm kind of just pushing against the, the whole, like, uh, okay, you're bleeding. You're in hor- you're in horrible pain. Well, you have to pretend you're not. I just, I can't stand, I can't stand seeing people have to go through that it's horrible and it's so I mean I'm 55 so that was totally the norm for me I was just when I was reading your book I was thinking about a very small anecdote that's really telling Um, I went to college for a while at Oberlin at the same time that um, Liz Fair was there and she was yeah and she was famous when she was at college, not for any of the things she became famous for later. She was famous because a group of us was once sitting around chatting with her roommate, men and women were all sitting in her room chatting with her roommate. And she walked into the room in front of this group of like seven people, went over to her desk, took a tampon out in front of us and left the room to go to the bathroom. And it was truly the most radical thing. Like it was wildly, and we were like punk rock kids, you know, but it was just stunning to us. What year was that? That would have been 1985 or six. Wow. 86, it would have been. Yeah, she was. Wow. Younger than She's me. such a rock star. That's, so, know, that's such exactly. a great story. <laughs> that's why she was famous in my brain and sort of yeah. still is, funnily enough. So anyway, um, so did you, can you talk more about like, did in getting from that place of sort of the shame and the kind of idea about one's own weakness 
and then where you are now. Do you feel like your diagnosis of PMDD was important? And can you talk about kind of getting that diagnosis and what a diagnosis means anyway? Yeah, and I would say I really didn't get the diagnosis. I diagnosed myself and then advocated for it. Um, I just just through my reading and really through my therapist, who's not she's you know not a psychiatrist or like anyone who can diagnose anyone, but through just talking with her, through the tracking, through the patterns, um, I was it, it was so clear to me. Like that's the thing about PMDD. It's like if you have it, you you'll know because it's yeah. not subtle. Um, yeah. So it was like, so, it was so obvious. Right. And so I had one doctor and she was incredibly dismissive and she, you know, she wrote it off as your, she, I described everything. And actually I, this is in the book, but I recorded the conversation. I had the, I had the foresight to record the conversation on my, my phone because I thought the conversation was so bizarre. So I hit voice memo and I was telling her about these these outbursts and this, this, this horrible, you know, PMS and that I thought it was PMDD. And I, I, I went on for probably 10 minutes and then she just, she barely looked at me and she just said, okay, irritability. And I said, no, it's not, it's not <laughs> irritability. I know what irritability feels like. It's not that. Um, so I switched doctors. I, I mean, I'm very lucky that I was able to only go to two doctors. You know, some people have spent right. their entire life. Some people, experience PMDD from their first period from age 11 or 12 and they're spending their whole life with misdiagnoses of either PMS or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or, mm -hmm. um, because people don't think or they I, they used to not think to look first at the cycle um so then I had a doctor who really listened and was incredibly helpful um and I wouldn't say she diagnosed me I would say I went in and I told her my diagnosis and she tended to agree based on um, everything I told her. And she asked me a million questions. I was very lucky because even though she was at the hospital here, she was incredibly holistic. Yeah. Um, and she believed a lot in, in exercise and diet and all of these things. And, but she did. So she never said to me like, yes, you have PMDD. But when I left the appointment that day and I got in the car, she had given me, you know, they give you your paper after the, the doctor, and it, and she had, you know, put PMDD on there. And I was just, I was very grateful to her in that moment and, and very relieved just to have been, to have been listened to. And I don't really identify with feeling, you know, I'm not, I, I don't feel like a PMDD advocate or like, like it, I think it was important in the way that you feel, and someone has written about this, I think Esme Wang in her book, The Collective mm -hmm. Schizophrenia, but it's relieving because you you learn that other people have gotten through something and survived it versus feeling like you're pioneering something on your own and that you're just crazy. So when you, you know, get this, that a doctor agrees with you and there's a name for something, it can feel just kind of just a weight off of your shoulders of like, okay, I'm not making this up. This is a thing that exists. Some people have it. There's a whole community of women who have it. And that was where the internet really came in handy, particularly Reddit. Um, where I found the PMDD werewolf week group. Right. That was really a lifesaver. Yeah. And I love the, the way you reflected um, using the internet to normalize your own experience. I mean, not norm, you know what I mean? Put your own yeah. experience into perspective. Um, I love the way you used that in the book by including the Reddit threads. And can you talk about bringing in the, the chorus of other voices? Yeah. Yeah. That was actually fun. Like that was part of the book that was fun, just like picking and choosing things from Reddit because people are so creative over there and just like writing a, amazing things. And I really, I hope this book helps people that were there because they all really, they all really helped me. Um, but yeah, I was looking at the PMS thread on Reddit and then looking at the PMDD thread and it was so obvious to me how different these things were. Mm. So that was why I chose to juxtapose them in the book. And, you know, there's the thread like ladies, what thing did you cry about with PMS? And people are like, oh, the, a cartoon, a Disney movie. And my cat is so adorable. And, and then I just didn't relate to that at all. Um, yeah. That was what I wished my cycles were like. And <laughs> then I went over to the werewolf week group and, and people were like tearing the shower curtain, you know, off of their, sh tearing the shower rod out of the wall and, and throwing things and having shame and no one believed them and they couldn't cope and and all these things and, and that was that was really helpful to see 
the difference in real time written by real people. Right, um, right, right. Yeah, so it was kind of fun in the book to like turn the lens off of me and to put it on other people. I think also there's probably like a defense mechanism that I use because I'm like, well, look, all these other people have it too. Like it, it's a way to kind of like back me up in my own book. But um, Reddit, Reddit was a big part of, of figuring things out. And then from there, I learned, you know, there was the PMDD group for partner partners of people who have PMDD. And I thought, well, that's really interesting because usually just the person writing the book has the perspective. But if I bring in, you know, the people that have to live with people with PMDD and their perspective, it just kept like widening the lens. Yeah, I was I was really interested that uh, one of the interviews with you on Autostraddle, Auto um, they brought up the idea of sobriety. And I was thinking the same thing as I was reading these collected voices. I was thinking about the voices you hear, I'm sober, the voices you hear in the rooms and the way that that Leslie Jameson has written about that idea of being ordinary and how sobriety kind of gives you your ordinary self, like it's a shared experience. And I really, I, I somehow that kept coming up with this book. Um, so interesting. Yeah, I, I never would have put that together, but I get it. I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, there's a really interesting section. Oh, before I go on, I'll remind people that the, I'll open the Q and A in like 10 minutes or something. So please feel free to put your questions in there. Um, uh, in the book, there's a really interesting passage where you talk about what it, I mean, this is, you're writing about your period. You're writing about being a woman who's in a relationship with a man. And there's this, passage in the book where you write about your queer identity um, as it exists within the framework of the things that I just said. So can you talk about how your definition of queerness changed over this period? Yeah, I didn't really realize that the book had so many identity shifts until someone pointed it out to me. And that's, you know, that's the beauty of writing a book <laughs> and then having people read it, right? Um, so wild to have people, people reading it and reflecting on it. Mm -hmm. um but there are a lot of identity shifts there's like you know I start the book with I, I just I was like single as the day was long and I had never lived with anyone um I was I was just so single and I was like getting getting really into that you know so there was the the shift of of being single to a really serious relationship and then I had written this book women where um, you know I never like had come out as queer or anything like that but the book became this emblem for for a lot of queer people and especially queer breakups and just love stories and heartbreak. And so that and identity, I, yeah, yes. And I would say that identity got kind of more put on me and my book. Um, mm. I, I wouldn't say I went out with the identity because, you know, the book is about just searching and really not knowing and being uncertain. Um, but mm. the book sort of took on this life of its own. Mm -hmm. And so it was very interesting to suddenly be in what looked like, and I have a chapter called nuclear family in the book. And I suddenly looked like I was in this nuclear family. And I went to post a photo of, you know, my boyfriend and I on, on Instagram. And I had a friend say to me, wow, you're coming out as straight or something like that, <laughs> you know, because to the public, I, I had this, the, you know, all of these people that had written to me because of my book, women. Um, so that's interesting. And yeah. So, do you think there's a way women got read as more autobiographical because of the rest of your body of work? For sure. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Interesting. 100%. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's the thing about writing about your life though, in real time. Right. And I mean, I, and I admit in, in the red zone, I do this to people too. You read someone's memoir and then you look up like, oh, are they still together or are they, you know, it's normal. It's normal to be curious. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think I had all of these identities going at the same time, you know, going from someone who didn't ever, you know, I've never barely been to the doctor or the hospital or anything and suddenly feeling like I had this medical thing going on, going from being totally mm. single to being almost a step parent very quickly and living with a child and, and, um, and a, and a man. So there were all of these shifts and I had to just I don't know, I had to just be, be flexible with them. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, one of the things I loved about the book was way it, um, 
I loved the character at the beginning, the single person, you know, determinedly single and sort of yeah. being pulled out of that identity. But I, I really loved the exploration of step families and divorce that informs the kind of last third or half of the book. And can you talk about how those themes weave together with the idea of what you were going through with your period? Yeah, it was it was sort of starting to look at as much as I think anyone can feel this way when they're going through something you you do want there's a the chapter called the magic bullet and you really want someone to just give you like one thing and then you're cured. Mm -hmm. And PMDD is it's really mysterious. I mean, I don't even know if I I I think it changes month to month. I think maybe some cycles can qualify as PMDD and other cycles are just PMS. I don't think it's like one and done. Um yeah. so yeah it was like a very layered treatment approach, which was frustrating um, in a lot of ways, because like I said, you want a shortcut. Um, so what I started doing was like peeling back more, more layers and, and thinking of like different things that could, could be exacerbating this PMDD that came out mm. as anxiety and rage. So, okay, where's this stemming from? Cause, and then there's the quote in the book where, you know, Roseanne Barr says like, oh, PMS okay. is only, is the only time, is the only time of the month I can actually be myself. So if, if there's a little bit of truth to that, then what, what was going on? So I knew there was like something under the root and it wasn't like just my hormones. I knew there was something. So I forced myself mm. really to, to go, to go deeper and, um, I started to get really fascinated with divorce just because, um, you know, my husband has been divorced, my parents are divorced, and then my, my stepdaughter, her parents are divorced. So I started to just to look at that and I got sort of fascinated the same way that I had gotten fascinated with my period. So I was just looking at yeah. these things that I had never thought were interesting before and trying to find connections that maybe weren't obvious um, mm -hmm. And that's the thing with the, the queer stuff and the step parenting too, just kind of bringing together. You wouldn't think you don't ever put those together, but if you, uh, I, I sort of, I say like being like a stepmom is kind of like being queer because no one can tell by looking at you and you, it's like kind of like invisibility and you can pass as, as straight and you can pass as a mom. So I, I had a lot of fun kind of trying to, to make these unexpected connections. Yeah. 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 Um, so given all that, there's, I mean, spoilies, the book ends with a marriage. And can you talk, you, you sort of poke at that idea in the book. You talk about other narratives or other memoirs that end with marriage. And um, can you talk about what it means to end a book with marriage, especially for a memoir? Um, <laughs> I can try. Yeah. yeah. I it's so I mean, funny. I'm fascinated by this. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. And and there was a review of the book in the Washington Post yesterday, and they said something about, you know, me me saying that a lot, you know, books and heroines end with either being wed or dead. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I remember going through a phase, it was really 2012 when I reached out to you and reading all these memoirs. So like Carrie Cohen's memoir, Loose mm -hmm. Girl, and Cheryl Strayed's memoir, Wild, and the Chronology of Water by Lydia Yuknovich and, and just thinking, okay, they're all getting married at the end. And, and when you're in your twenties and you could care less about marriage, it's like very disappointing. Um, I really didn't want them to be married at the end. So I sort of, I really, I really hated that I had to do that for my book at the same time. I think at, at the same time, I'm just accepting it. And I do think it, it creates a really nice a really nice arc and it, and it did feel natural to do, but I'm glad I took the space to, to call out and kind of like apologize to any readers that feel disappointed. Um, Cause right. when you have like public persona and you feel like, oh, I was single and all these people like looked up to me and like single and queer. And then suddenly you're like married and, you know, to admit it's like, but at the same time you have to live your life authentically. So what, what are you gonna do? Um, exactly. So I really, I really like the ending and it came to me organically. And um, I was actually came to me, I was in, um, I took a writing class with T. Kara Madden, who wrote mm -hmm. Long, Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls. And she had some amazing writing prompt with beginning sentences and ending sentences and putting them together. And, and it came to me and I, I stuck with it and I never, I never question, questioned it. I could, because I also thought, you know, of, of course I have my period on my wedding day. And of course, that's how I have to end my book. If I hadn't yeah. had my period on my wedding day, 
I wouldn't have ended with my wedding day. Right. I, I, and there's something, I don't know. I think that there is something about a plot ending with marriage that is such a literary, I mean, Mm. the marriage plot, you know, it's just such a, it's such a literary device. And I think both using it and sort of interrogating it at the same time is really interesting. And, you know, it's your, it's a question of who is your life for? Like, I remember a student who read the chronology of water and she was just furious when she finished it because of the heteronormative ending. And it was like, well, yeah. I mean, what are you going to do? That's her life. Right. Um, I was thinking a lot as I was reading this about uh, expertise. So you were talking about finding this balance between reporting and a memoir in the book. And I wondered if you, if you struggled at all with like how expert to make the voice, mm. or how much factual information to bring. That was so hard. That was probably, that was probably the hardest part. Um, I did the first couple of years I was working on it. I did feel immense pressure to because I had, like I said, like written, you know, two essay collections already. So I was like, wow, oh, do I really want to write another, another thing about my life? Maybe this could be different and this could be, you know, research and a lot more scientific. And, <laughs> and I really tried to do that. And then ultimately it just was not my style. And I felt so much more comfortable bringing in like my story and then a little of science or, or things I read and then read it. And then what a friend said, and more of a collage, that's just feels more natural to me. And it was really hard because the studies on PMDD change like every day. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't, I, I felt so sort of at, at times probably paralyzed by that and a little bit terrified because I couldn't put any, th there's a lot of unknown facts. So how am I going to write this book on such a medical, on a, such a controversial um you know, medical diagnosis. So for me, ultimately, it felt safer to just tell my experience with it and to just be questioning rather mm -hmm. than teaching. And then I think, you know, the beauty of that is people do learn, are learning things through the book, the way I'm learning through the narrators, exactly. like learning through the book. So um, yeah, I had to, I had to sort of, I had to give up that dream and just be like, all right, I'm not a scientist and I'm yeah. more <laughs> Morris, so I'll just do, I'll do what I know how to do. I think it's really interesting to write about because you do include a lot of information in the book, but you don't do it in a voice of expertise. And I think it makes it more powerful. It's sort of like you're joining all the Reddit voices and it, the subjective, the foreground and subjectivity um, made me reflect much more on my own experience in a way that it, I thought it was really powerful. Um, I'm going to ask you just a craft. My students always, you're going to be annoyed by this question. Um, <laughs> But I'm just going to ask it. Uh, student memoir students always want to. There, there's the question they really want to know, and you know what it is: <laughs> is writing about real people. Um, yeah. yeah, like that's always the question. So yeah. um, I know that that's a loaded question, just because it's sort of it can have a gotcha quality. But for me, in my writing, I tend to kind of create a policy and follow it so I don't have to like relitigate the problem every time. And I'm wondering if you've done a similar thing because you've written so much about your life and and what's your approach to writing about real people? Yeah, well, I, I talked about, I was talking about this the other night. It was funny because even as I was signing books in Brooklyn, people were like getting their books signed, but also like, so how do you write about your life? Because like, yeah. I wanted to like, try to like speak in the question. Um, so interesting everyone has is so paralyzed around it um mm -hmm. yeah well I was explaining the other night that this is the first book I've written while being in a relationship and it's a lot easier to to write your books when you're single um mm -hmm. so that was a freedom I had with my prior three books and with this book I mean I know it it, it seems to people like with my writing like oh everything's out there and you know it's it doesn't feel like that to me because this right. was very much, I kept the container of PMDD on it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's tons, tons left out and I, I kept it to one subject. So that was, that was really helpful. And, you know, to anyone who ever, uh, the thing about this question is it's such a case by case. Mm -hmm. there, there's no answer because everyone's family or relationship is so different. So whatever works for me isn't going to work for someone else. Um, but what I try to tell people, because people have this feeling that they're going to ask you, 
what is it like to write about people in your life? And you're going to say, oh my God, I'm totally ostracized and my family hates me. <laughs> but, and it's not like that at all. It's the most normal life. And the people that support you, support you. Like my aunts are here tonight. And like oh, my mom was there the other night. My stepdaughter was at my reading. Like people think that they, they really want this juicy answer that like everyone hates you or something. And you've been cast out. Yeah, it's really, I don't know why people, I, I think it's, the, my theory is they're looking for an excuse like not to write. You know, they want, they want to be told like, yeah, you shouldn't do it. It's a horrible life. It's not a horrible It'll life. It'll be a nightmare for you. Yeah. If anything, it expands your life and like you get to know people on a deeper level and they get to know you on a deeper level and um, you get to have really interesting conversations. So I, I think, yes, it's definitely good to have boundaries and be careful. I'm not saying like you should, you know, vomit your life on the page or anything like that, but just remembering you're in control of what you're writing and you can leave out whatever you want to leave out. You, you do have control. I love that. Hi, Chloe's aunts. I love that you're there. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to the Q and a, uh, first Jennifer asks, I'm curious if Chloe has children and if she experienced PPD or PPA, and if there's a relationship with PMDD and PPD, meaning postpartum depression, oh, God. And you do write a bit, little bit about this. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have, um, biological children. I have a stepdaughter. So, um, I have not experienced that. However, I have heard there's a really big correlation. And when I was at the Break the Cycle conference in Florida on PMDD, um, many of the women there, actually their PMDD symptoms began after having children. And mm. for other people, they've maybe had PMDD and then it goes away for the nine months that they're pregnant. And then it comes back with a vengeance. Um, some of the women at that conference, it was, it was hard to hear. Some of the women had even had hysterectomies to deal, to, to mm -hmm. alleviate their, themselves of their symptoms of, of PMDD. Um, yeah. But um, yes, yeah, so yeah, I, I believe that there is a, a correlation. Um, Jessica says, I like that you placed your book in a lineage, flash, flash count diary and motherhood. I love that. What other stories are needed in this lineage? Interesting. Hmm. That is interesting. I think people are starting to write a lot more about postpartum depression, which I think is great. There seems to be, you know, it, I act like it's a lot of books, probably like three, three to five. So we need, you know, more of those stories and honest stories about being pregnant and giving birth and um, infertility. Um, and I think that people should be, you know, other people, I would be interested to read other people's stories about, about their periods. And one thing, you know, there's a chapter in the book called the linen closet. And that goes through like 1920 to 2019 of, of all different first periods. And it's really like a mini anthology. Um, and I think it would be amazing to have an anthology of people's first periods that's chronological um, mm. that really shows, and, and mine does it in a mini way, but like just shows the evolution of period technology and, and cultural standpoints and, and how people experience their periods. I think that would be really cool, but yeah, I think anyone that wants to add, add their voice so that I'm not the only like period <laughs> memoir out there would be great. <laughs> um, Jessica has a second question. It seems like the science around women and hormones, especially perimenopause, midlife hormonal changes is lacking. Do you agree? And did that lack affect your research process? Yeah, for sure. Because that's so funny that you say that because I was talking with someone recently and they're like, well, what did you figure out was causing your PMG? I was like, I have no idea. Um, that's kind of what I like about the book though, in a way it's like, I, I like that it was a mystery. And at the same time, of course, mm. it's super frustrating um, to constantly be reading different sides and like, no, it's caused by this, actually right. this. So now we learned that progesterone cures it oh but for some people progesterone makes them suicidal so it's like there's no you know and I put this in an interview recently but um Catherine Cohen a friend of mine a comedian has a Netflix special and she talks about polycystic ovarian syndrome PCOS and she says everything online about women's health is just we don't know good luck you know right. so um so yeah I think I think all of those, all of those stories are, are missing. And also it's not one size fits all. Like what happened with me is not everyone's experience. Some people 
have no problem with their period. So I think that's why like a more chorus of, vo of voices would be good. And yeah, someone did ask me if this was going to be a series. So it was like PMDD and then perimenopause and then menopause. <laughs> I don't know. I, I doubt it, but you'll yeah. see. It's yeah. interesting to think about just as a sidebar, you know, with more people using HRT and more people using hormones in such a thoughtful way for transitions or just to adjust, adjust their gender experience. It'll be really interesting to see how that affects information. Exactly. Um, uh, some, uh, Maureen writes, obviously dealing with your period has evolved over the years, but wondering if Chloe has suggestions on continuing, the lesson to, continuing to lessen the stigma or embarrassment to young women. That's my aunt. Hi, Aunt Maureen. She's in Portland. Um, yeah, I think just talking about it openly, especially like in the home, if you do have kids, regardless of their gender, is really the the best thing to do. And I, I've been thinking of it as just like neutralizing your period. Like I'm not trying to manipulate anyone into like loving their period or feeling like they should be excited about their period or like positive even. I think, right. but I do think just looking at it more is just like, this is a fact and it's something that happens. And, um, you know, there's a lot of stories in the book about people when they, when they learned about their periods in school, um, they would separate the boys and the girls. So only the girls would learn about their period and, yeah. and the boys didn't have to hear. So I just think, you know, regardless of gender, just having it be like a neutral topic so that it does not feel taboo. Um, even in the book, of the in the linen closet chapter up to 2019 even my cousin said still people were hiding tampons in their sleeves so like right, you're yes. in the 1980s so it, it's it's um it's come a long way and, and and i also don't mean to say like everyone should be talking about their period all the time i just think it should be accepted of what it is which is a fact of life just like everything else people talk about you know pooping and giving birth and things like this so it's it's just it's a normal fact of life. So how do we just make that be like a neutral topic and not an ew, gross topic? Right, right. Or even just, you know, you write in the book about the blue liquid um, yeah. and the, I, but the idea I tried to imagine writing about the blue liquid that's always used in like tampon or pad ads rather than blood. And I tried to imagine those ads with red liquid and I just like, I couldn't do it. My brain just sort of no. shut down. You yeah. Know, it's, it's wild. Impossible. Yeah. And that's now. Okay. We have another question or a comment from, oh, we have a question from Carly. She says, I biked all over Brooklyn today with the audiobook in my ears. Can't tell you how much it means to have a story that pulls PMDD into focus. It's been an insane journey for me. How do you maintain creative routines, practices, and in particular on your worst days? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Aww. Yeah. Aww. I'm sorry that you're struggling with it. On my worst days, so for me with PMDD, what I learned at the conference was to try to shrink your symptoms. So if you're, you know, some people have symptoms since they ovulate and then they have two weeks of symptoms. So how do you get those symptoms to be like 10 days and then to five days and then to three mm. days? Um, all with trial and error, of course, of whatever your doctor recommends and medication, supplements, exercise. But for me on my worst days, I, I let myself have bad days or, or um, and just like I was saying before, and just rest those days and give up the whole muscling through and have to work through it and keep working and being productive, even though I don't feel good or, and I'm in pain. Um, I now, I now give over to it. And that has been really, really helpful for me. Um, just taking, taking a day off. And, um, you know, I just talk with the BBC because Australia is about to make menstrual leave the law, you get 10 days menstrual leave. So, wow. you know, so they, <laughs> yes. So take your own menstrual leave if you can, you know, and of course not everyone can with their, with their job. And, um, but if you can, and if you can say to a boss or a friend or a social obligation, Hey, I don't feel good. I'm, I'm going to be resting today and actually succumbing to it instead of fighting through it for me is what has been helpful. And I hope, I hope that helps her too. Were there things that um, you started employing in your self-care around your period that, that you would never have thought you would do, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of surprised you? Kind of. Like, I, I, 
you know, it's, there's nothing more infuriating than to hear that, like, you know, when you're suffering from cramps or, or mental issues that people, when people are like, you should exercise, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> lead, leading up to your period, or like you should exercise and your cramps will go away. It's like, you're not, that's the last thing you're thinking about when you're having horrible cramps, you're not going to be exercising. That said, yes, I, I think, you know, being outside and just even taking like very, like even just slow, long walks, like three days leading up to your period really can help like move things, move things along. Um, I feel like, I don't know if people still use hot water bottles, but I like <laughs> I use them. I got back into them. I used to use them as a teenager and now I use them again. I find them really comforting. Um, and then even, and then I also just let myself those days. I'm like, I'm going to just eat like whatever food I want to eat and just have like, have some kind of something nice, something nice for yourself. Um, food wise, rest wise. I don't know. Maybe that all sounds really cliche, but it has no, been, it doesn't it's at been all. a lot better. It's been a lot better than just pretending nothing's, nothing's happening to me and being honest. I'll, I'll say to my, my stepdaughter and my husband will like, you know, I'm not feeling so good today. So I'm going to go lie down and, and being transparent about it. Hmm. Well, we have one more minute. Is there anything that you would want? I don't know that you want people to know about their periods. You know, what, what would you want them to take away? I just think like, be kind to it and kind to yourself through it. And, you know, there are communities out there if you are struggling and the IAPMD.org is great. Um, or the International Association for Premenstrual Disorders. They're wonderful. And just talk to other people because, you know, everyone is going through this in some form. And I forgot to even show my book, but this, this <laughs> book. And you can get it wherever books are sold. And I, I really appreciate everyone, everyone coming. Yeah. And um, thank you. I just will repeat that I think Chloe is just brilliant and I loved this book and but I love all her books and read them all. Um, <laughs> welcome. All right. I think Mark's going to get back. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Claire. That was great. I really appreciate being part of that conversation. Well, just listening to that conversation. Um, that was special for me as well because Chloe used to work here at Powell's oh, Employment, yeah. so it was fun to check in and see her again. Um, thank you, everyone. Yeah, you can buy The Red Zone anywhere. Books are sold, but why not pals.com? Um, while you're there, you can pick up Claire's books as well, and you can see all of our upcoming events. That's pals.com. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and um, we'll see you at another one of these soon. Um, Thank you all. I'm going Thank to hang you. up now. <laughs> Take care. Bye. 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 Bye, Chloe. Thanks, Claire. Bye, Claire. Thank you so much. Talk later. My pleasure.